Shalom, friends. Today I have an exciting program. I want to talk to you about the Jewish wedding system and the Bride of Messiah. Uh, but first, uh, I want to invite you to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and give us a thumbs up. It really helps. Thank you. So, I want to look at uh, Messiah's relationship with his body, the church, the body of Messiah. It's very helpful to believers uh, in understanding our role as followers of Yeshua. Uh, it is critical that we look at this relationship in the context in which God gave it to us, which is, of course, the, uh, the Jewish context. Uh, there's a wonderful parallel between the Jewish wedding system and the program that God has between Messiah as the groom and the church as the bride, the bride of Messiah. Uh, the main theme throughout the whole thing is hope. And it's also going to help us understand eschatology, which is the, uh, the end times, the order of events. So the first scripture I want to I uh, comment on is Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. So in, in Ephesians 5, 22 and following, we learn a little bit about this context, and it kind of sets the stage. And I quote, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Messiah also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Messiah, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands are also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Messiah also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great but I am speaking with reference to Messiah and the church. So as uh, Paul is speaking of the relationship between the husband and wife and the sacrifices and the love, he's also telling us that this is a relationship between the Messiah and the church, between the bridegroom and the bride. The way the two correspond can be divided into six different parts, all under the theme of hope again. Additionally, the order of events will shed some light on the sequence of end times event. The first one, according to the Jewish wedding system, is known as the arrangement. We'll call it the price of hope. Every single one will have a, a reference to hope. So the arrangement, the price of hope. The very first step in a Jewish wedding system is the arrangement. During this first step, the father of the groom makes the arrangement with the father of the bride and pays the father of the bride the bride price. Many times this was a stage that occurred when both the future groom and the future bride were children and very often don't even, didn't even know each other in the Jewish tradition. The obvious parallel is that God the father, the father of the groom, made the original arrangement followed by paying the price for the bride. Of course, in this case, the price for the bride was his son's very blood on the cross, shed for all of us. Ephesians 5.25, and I quote, Messiah also loved the church and gave himself up for it. 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Yeshua the Messiah, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Next step, number two, is the preparation or the promise of hope. Uh, the preparation is also known as the period of betrothal. It typically lasted for a year, 
uh, but in some cases could last for more, especially if the, 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 the bride and groom were uh, sealed by the parents together at, at an early stage in life through the first step known as the arrangement. The second period is the time when the bride is being prepared to be a, a, a fitting wife for the groom. This is also the period of time when the bride is closely observed for her purity. This is the main reason why betrothal would last at least for one full year, so that the bride could be observed and so that uh, at least nine months would, 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 uh, would pass and she could be officially declared a virgin. If she would give birth within that period, she would then be in a state of immorality and it would force all parties involved to annul the wedding. The precedent is found in, uh, in the Mosaic Law about what is known as the, the water of bitterness and is developed further in the Talmud in the two tractates, Sota and Gitin. In Numbers 5, 11 through 31, we read this very interesting passage where a woman will be tested for her purity in the context of, uh, of marriage. Uh, and, and I quote, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and a man has intercourse with her and is, it is hidden from the eyes of her husband and she is undetected, although she has defiled herself, and there is no witness against her and she has not been caught in the act. If a spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife when she has defiled herself, or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife when she has not defiled herself, the man shall then bring his wife to the priest and shall bring as an offering for her one-tenth of an ephah of barley meat, a meal, uh, and uh, he shall uh, not pour oil on it nor put frankincense on it, for it is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of memorial, a reminder of iniquity. Then the priest shall bring her near and have her stand before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel, and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. When he has made the drink, the water then it, 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 when he has made her drink the water, then it should come about, if she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, that the water which brings a curse will go into her and cause bitterness, and her abdomen will swell, and her thigh will waste away, and the woman will become a curse among our people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, she will then be free and conceive children. This is the law of jealousy when a wife being under the authority of her husband goes astray and defiles herself. Or when a spirit of jealousy comes over a man and he is jealous of his wife, he shall then make the woman stand before the Lord and the priest shall apply all this law to her. Moreover, the man will be free from guilt but that woman shall bear her guilt. So this is a lengthy passage here, but this explains why Joseph and Mary, uh, uh, Joseph was so concerned about Mary, uh, unex or an unexpected pregnancy, and why he originally explored the idea of sending her away before, it was, uh, before he was approached by Gabriel, who explained to him that she had been... Uh, uh, she was pregnant uh, through the Holy Spirit, she had not been uh, unfaithful. So our application to Messiah's body is that even today, the church, the body of Messiah, the bride, is in the process of being perfected for the groom. We can see this in two passages, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband that I might present you as a pure virgin to Messiah. And um, Ephesians 5, 27 that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. 
So those are the, the, the two passages. According to verse 26, the body of Messiah, the church, is now undergoing a process of sanctification, which means to be set apart. And it's a process. It, 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 it's over the life of the believer. Being set apart, the purpose for this process is to present to Messiah, the groom, a glorious bride, the church. This basically means the same as uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. The two passages I just read to you. So he then gives us four characteristics of a glorified church. We find out that the church will be spotless with no outward defilement. There will be no wrinkle, which means no evidence of age. It will be holy, meaning it will reach full, final sanctification. And there will be no blemish or inward defilement. This is something we're all looking forward to, I know. There is a specific time when this will happen to the church, and that is at the time of the judgment seat of Messiah, when all wood and hay will be burned away, and gold, silver, and precious stones will be purified by that fire of judgment. That's for believers. They will not lose their salvation at that time. They will simply maybe miss out on some of the rewards that they could get, depending on how they serve the Lord. But this is not about salvation. Finally, in verse 29, we read that the church is being nourished or built up and strengthened, and it is also, uh, is also uh, cherished or cared for with warmth and tenderness. So first, the arrangement or the price of hope. Second, the preparation, the promise of hope. Now third is the fetching of the bride, according to the Jewish wedding system. We'll call it the return of hope. According to the Jewish wedding system, the groom would go to the home of the bride and fetch her to his home. This would eventually lead to a bridal procession, as we can read in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 uh, through 13. Interesting passage here, and I quote, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you as well. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. The application uh, uh, on this passage uh, the application to, to, to the bride of Messiah here is the rapture of the church. The fetching of the bride is the rapture of the church, as seen in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And I quote, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Yeshua. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the idea, and the, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive, 
and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. What a great promise. What a wonderful time we're looking forward to. So Paul starts in verse 13 through 15 to tell us that the dead saints will be first to go and then the living saints. Then in verse 16 through 17, he spells out the seven steps by which the rapture will occur. It's, it's, it's like very, very uh, structured in order. Uh, first, Messiah will come uh, uh, from heaven into the, earth, the earth's atmosphere, and in that sense, he will enter into the realm of the, the, the home of the bride. Second, he will give a shout, like a military command, to the, uh, for the process to begin. Third, Michael the archangel will repeat Messiah's command, like a subcommander would repeat the orders of a, of, of a, a leader, like a, of a general in the army. Fourth comes the trump of God that will sound just like it would in battle for the soldiers to know that they are to make their move. Fifth, the dead and Messiah will rise first and thus not miss out on the rapture. Sixth, the living in Messiah will then meet him in the air. And finally, the believers will be with the Lord to never ever be separated again. It is after the fetching of the bride into heaven that will come the final point of cleansing or uh, sanctification. Look at Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, uh, 10 through, uh, through 15. And I quote, According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Yeshua the Messiah. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each, man, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show. The day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man, man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So again, no loss of salvation, just loss of rewards here. Uh, also, according to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 15 through 58, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, the church will indeed be glorified because at that very point, mortality will put on immortality and corruption will put on incorruption. That is what we find in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. Now I say this, brethren, the flesh and blood that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable Will, will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Therefore, my, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. This is amazing. This is what we have to look forward to, but we do have to be steadfast. So again, first, the arrangement. We called it the price of hope. Second, the preparation, the promise of hope. Third, the fetching of the bride, the return of hope. Then we have fourth, 
the ceremony, the, we call it the, the restoration of hope. Uh, the ceremony was conducted in the home of the groom. Only a few, usually the immediate family and, 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 and the two witnesses uh, were invited to come, uh, to come in and, and, and observe the wedding ceremony. And that, again, the parallel here is, is that there will be a ceremony in heaven for the bride, the church, the body of Messiah, and the groom, the Messiah. The few that will be invited will be the few that have already been resurrected through the rapture right before, as seen in Revelation 19, 6 through 8. And I quote, Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the, the Almighty reigns. So we're looking at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It, it was given uh, to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. This scripture contains the fourth step, the ceremony. This ceremony will be in heaven and will be followed by the, uh, uh, the second coming of the Messiah with the saints, as we see in uh, the following verses 11 through 16 in Revelation, which is uh, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wow. Now, as it pertains to the church, three aspects of the whole Jewish wedding system are found here. First, the marriage and the ceremony take place in heaven before the second coming. Second, the wife has made herself ready as she is now glorified. No more spot, blemish, wrinkles. Third, she's dressed in fine white linen, which represents the righteous acts of the saints. So by this time, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the judgment uh, is over with. The, uh, uh, the judgment seat uh, is, of Messiah is over with. Uh, the sanctification process is complete and the church is indeed like a pure virgin being presented to Messiah. How beautiful is that? So again, number one, the arrangement, the price of hope. Two, the preparation, the promise of hope. Three, the fetching of the bride, the return of hope. For the ceremony or the restoration of hope. Now, five is the marriage feast, which is the celebration of hope. According to the Jewish wedding system, the marriage feast has many more uh, people invited. Often the marriage feast would, take, would last up to seven days or even up to two weeks if the family was very wealthy. The application to the church here is that the marriage feast will take place on earth. As a matter of fact, the kingdom will start with a marriage feast. We know it as the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Old Testament saints who will be resurrected at the, uh, at, the, at, at the end, after the tribulation, will be at the marriage feast 
We uh, read about this in uh, Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn. And the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. So also in uh, Daniel uh, 12, 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So here in that passage of Daniel 12, 2, we see that there's really two different resurrections. The resurrection of the righteous to the wedding feast and the resurrection of the unrighteous away from God. John the Baptist, incidentally, classified himself as being neither from the groom nor the bride's part, but as being a friend of the bridegroom. The Old Testament saints are the friends of the bridegroom. John 3, 28 through 30 uh, sheds light on that. Uh, and I quote, You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase but I must decrease. Another group uh, joining the marriage feast uh, at that time will be the tribulation saints who have survived uh, the seven-year tribulation. They will be resurrected after the second coming, the Revelation 20, uh, 4 through 6. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Yeshua and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand and they came to life and reigned with Christ with Messiah for a thousand years the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed this is the first resurrection Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Messiah and will reign with Him for a thousand years. So there's definitely two, di two, two different resurrections. And the one that connects to the, the Jewish wedding system is the resurrection of the saints. The third group that will partake uh, in uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb is, uh, will be Israel, surviving Israel, the living Israel that survives the tribulation when all Israel will be saved, according to Romans 12, 26, will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For I, and, and let, me, let me quote the, the, this verse, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial learning a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written. Isaiah 25, 6 teaches us that the kingdom will start with the marriage feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. As a matter of fact, the invitation is sent out just before the second coming. Revelations 19, 6-8. I think uh, uh, I uh, read it before. Uh, let me read it again. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. It, it really is worth repeating because it really uh, gives us a clear image of what's going to happen. In verse 9, he talks about the wedding feast. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. So the second coming will take place followed by a 75-day interval, that's for another time, uh, uh, and then the kingdom is introduced by the marriage supper of the Lamb that will last uh, seven days, uh, possibly uh, a group of seven, could be even seven years, could be a long time, as the introduction of the uh, millennial kingdom. 
So again, number one, the arrangement, the price of hope. Two, the preparation, the promise of hope. Three, the fetching of the bride, the return of hope. Four, the ceremony, the restoration of hope. Five, the marriage feast, the celebration of hope. And six is the home of the bride, the eternal hope. That's the final, uh, the final part. In the Jewish context, the groom is res responsible to provide a suitable house for the bride. And he does it during the second stage, the preparation stage, when he goes back and builds a house for the bride before he could come back and fetch the bride. John 14, 1 through 3 tells us, explains the connection to us. And I quote, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. This is the glorious hope. This is the glorious future and uh, the beautiful hope that we have. John 14, 1 through 3 tells us that the, uh, at the ascension, Yeshua went back to heaven to prepare a place for his bride, known as the New Jerusalem, which Yeshua is preparing now for the believers to move to during the eternal order. We read about this in uh, Revelations 21, 9 through 22, 5, especially uh, uh, verses 9 and 10. And I quote, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. So according to verse, uh, uh, verse 9, the bride is now also the wife of the Lamb, as they have been married for a thousand years. After the thousand years, John sees in verse 10 the eternal home of the bride, the new Jerusalem. The rest of the passage uh, spells out the, the details about the New Jerusalem. But that's, that's, that's where we are. So, conclusion. As far as the relationship between the, uh, the, the Jewish wedding system and, the, and Messiah and the church, some aspects have been fulfilled and some are in the process of being fulfilled and will be fulfilled in the future. All steps point us to Yeshua the Messiah, our only hope. It also seems to indicate a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial rapture of the believers as we look at the order of events in the Jewish wedding system that line up with the order of events of a rapture, tribulation, second coming, millennial kingdom, and eternal order. According to that order of the Jewish wedding system, uh, again, believers will go through a rapture, the, uh, uh, the uh, judgment seat of Messiah, the return uh, with Messiah after the rapture at the second coming, the millennial kingdom on earth, and the eternal order in the new Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem. So this, the, the, all the parts uh, are the price of hope, the promise of hope, the return of hope, the restoration of hope, the celebration of hope, and the eternal hope. I hope you enjoyed this uh, um, program on the Jewish wedding system and the Bride of Messiah. Uh, please consider subscribing, giving us a thumbs up, and hitting the notification bell so you won't miss any other teachings that I will have to offer in the future. Until next time, Shalom and be blessed. Mm -hmm.